So in this video, we'll be talking about the idea of this new order um, taking over the kind of old um, order and how things I think would change a lot. And I think how this has um, implication regarding uh, both um, life-wise environment and also the uh, personal investment kind of strategy. First up, let's take a look at the agenda for today. So we'll first talk, cover a little bit of history, kind of see like, you know, what took us to our present day. Then I'll talk about kind of the present day conflicts. And then we'll talk about what I'm expecting going forward. And also I'll cover up what's the kind of Fed decision um, kind of going forward. Because again, that we're, we're routing it back into the kind of investment piece and then finally I'll cover up with the summary. So first off let's take a look at some history. So how did US become the center of power after World War II and Cold War? Well they were already a strong manufacturing co uh, country prior to World War II and they were one of the few that did not suffer much uh, destruction of their manufacturing ability and obviously their continent. And they were able to pr provide aid to other countries by way of lending, meaning like, hey, I'll help you send you supplies, but, you know, this is not a gift, you know, pay me back later. So again, not only were they able to keep their production um, up, well, throughout the whole war, um, they were, and after, they were also able to um, send out loans, which then the, as other countries were built and they repaid, and during the Cold War, they really only, like after World War II and into Cold War, they only really had one competitor, which was, you know, USSR. And eventually, um, USSR uh, crumbled, and then US had no, uh, no more competitor. And what they were able to do uh, the whole time was that before, um, everyone had their currency backed uh, with gold. But because they needed funds immediately and they didn't have um, uh, the gold available, so they were like, oh, okay, um, U.S. said, hey, just use U.S. dollars, right? Um, I'll tie my currency to gold to a fixed amount. And the world believed it. But the problem arose as U.S. kept spending uh, more than it was generating and so what happens is the US dollar was getting devaluated um, against gold because there wasn't as much gold to back up its currency and Fr uh, the French central bank was one of the few ones that first noticed it and it started redeeming um, its US dollars uh, against gold because hey I don't want this um, you know fiat currency that you're saying um, is not worth as much gold as you would have promised. So I, I, I'm calling you on your buff, bluff. I'm going to take my gold instead. <clears throat> and then what Nixon had uh, did, well, he chose to do, he didn't have to, could have chose other ways, is to take um, the world saying, hey, we're, you we can no longer uh, exchange for gold. We are just you know, a fiat currency, like we are backed by nothing, which caused a significant decline of the US dollar versus gold. That's why you saw the gold price skyrocket from 35, I think, to 800. But what was able to save it was they tied US dollar to petro uh, like oil. Well, how did that work? What happened was they <clears throat> made it sure that uh, Middle East use US dollar and so there is a constant demand um, in, in US dollar in terms of oil trades it must be priced in oil or mu the oil must be priced in US dollar and so what that caused was then there's a uh, significant demand because you know oil is used worldwide for US dollar and throughout this whole process <clears throat> and more recently US um, instead of being kind of trade uh, neutral like you know whenever countries produce and trade the idea is you 
produce something that you have a competitive com advantage in, and others do the the same, and then you trade, and everyone is better off. Well, what happens is U.S. stopped producing the uh, producing processing. Uh, supply chain was all moved away from U.S. and they focused on they try to focus on more um, I guess quote high value uh, production and they did not produce as much as they used to and so they became a net importer which means their trade deficit increases because they are taking in more than they are putting out to the world and they became a borrower because that's where that different com comes from and so they're becoming a big consumer. Next up let's talk about like kind of the past 40 years kind of investment uh, environment. So since the stagflation era <clears throat> there there has been a 40 years of bull uh, market and bonds which helped the narrative which helped allow US to continue to borrow from other countries. Well, you're thinking, why would other countries say not trade with US in goods? Because So let's say China produced toys, whatever, trade to US. Well, US doesn't have enough goods to trade back, and that's why there's a trade deficit. So US send back uh, US treasuries. Well, why is China taking it? Well, that's because, let's say you're producing something and you're working hard in your life, like, you know, you're working hard at your job. You don't need the money. You don't need all of it right now. You're saving some for retirement. And that's the idea. I don't need all of the money now, so I'm going to invest it. Well, how am I going to invest it? Okay, he's lending me money in a bond, in a promise to pay, and he's giving me interest. Well... Maybe I'll take that. And the reason why um, people are very happy to take it is not only because, you know, the U.S. currency you use worldwide, but also the treasuries continue to appreciate because there has been the, a bull market in bonds for the last 40 years. Well, not the last two, but um, from 1980s to 2022 where the yields continue to fall. And so the bonds, the treasuries that people uh, bought up or result of trade kept going up in value. And so that's why the rest of the world were more than happy to lend money to the US. And by the continued lower rates, again, it, pro again, it promoted lending to US it supports the equity market because when you have lower yields, continuously lower yields, then equity market looks more attractive because let's like because you have to make a decision. Okay, am I going to invest in bonds or am I going to invest in equity? Let's say a bond fixed rate yielding like, you know, 5%. Not nowadays, but you know, back in the day then or equity yielding maybe like seven eight percent but are you willing to take the risk in comparison right so you have to take a look at the risk adjusted uh, return to see if you're willing so at but if the bond yields are lower then the attractiveness in comparison of equity market increases and finally, the kind of 60-40 allocation worked where, let's say, you have 60% in equity, 40% in bonds. And what happen What has happened is usually when um, equities fall, bond, uh, like yields come down and bonds go up. So it kind of worked in terms of diversifying your portfolio, having the kind of 60-40, meaning um, a different allocation in both equity and bonds. But what we've seen recently is that both bonds and stocks can both fall in price together. And I expect this is something to um, continue 
for the long term as well. Not a lot all the time, but I do expect that that's kind of what we're entering in terms of environment where both asset classes can fall at the same time. And there's also been a lot of globalization. There is a lot more uh, international trade, which again helps uh, U.S. to not have to produce as much because uh, they're able to rely on the rest of the world to produce stuff that they need. <clears throat> and we've seen a massive expansion of debt, trade deficit, government spending, where, again, in order to facil facilitate U.S. not having to produce <clears throat> as much lending money to buy stuff from the rest of the world, that's what we see, um, you know, trade deficit increasing, and, you know, there's still a, a euphoric feeling like, oh, we don't have to do as much, and we can just, you know, just spend, and it's okay. Like, there's been a lot of promotion on, you know, spending on that aspect, and that's what we see a massive expansion of debt. And also because, you know, everyone's feeling wealthy, government, um, because of the productivity increase in its people, like GDP growth and, and all that, um, you know, government feel like, oh, okay, I can also spend more. <clears throat> and we're also having a huge reliance on central bank money printing, so aka QE, um, also a little bit on controlling of interest rates, which you know kind of helps, but that's not money printing, it's just mainly QE, <clears throat> to prop up asset prices. So what happens is whenever, you know, um, stock market throws a tantrum, the Fed will come out for the rescue. And the MMT, modern monetary th um, theory narrative, is that, oh, okay, as long as you keep printing money, it will help growth, and therefore, and you know, as long as there's no inflation, it's all good. It's good to go, and that only worked as funds were flowing into financial markets. Is what we saw in two thousand and one and two thousand and eight, like aftermath wise, where a lot of money was um, being put into uh, the system as money supply. I understand QE didn't start until like you know two thousand and eight, but and. and as part of the monetary uh, policy easing, you know, a lot it increased the money supply, which um, all of that were flown into the financial markets, which help prop uh, the asset prices back up. But what happens in this time in two thousand, you know, with with the pandemic and and now with the world decoupling, is that there's now a supply constraint for the world and what happens is now these funds um, also are not just going into companies not going into banks they're going into av everyday people and so what happens is now we're seeing uh, inflation not just prop up in financial markets but rather in supermarkets and finally uh, money printing and inflation widens the wealth gap well, wh well why is that that's because well, when you use money to buy things, it, in, like, it, you do nothing in terms of increasing supply. Because let's say, you know, everyone gets a dollar more with no change to supply. All you've done is increase the number of dollars that can be used to buy stuff. And because of that, um, those who have stuff usually the more wealthier bunch, they will see their wealth increase while the consumers who want to buy stuff only experiences price increase. So they don't have the benefit of seeing their asset portfolio increase while uh, the rich does. And that's kind of why you see the wealth gap and why inflation is bad and worst for um, the poorer um, segment of the economy. Now, let's talk a little bit more about financial markets in terms of um, how it has operated um, and why it kind of creates some tensions between people, where 
it's now no longer as simple as buying profitable cash flow positive companies where <clears throat> that used to be the mindset like why do I want to buy into a business that's losing money I understand that some people would say well that's growth well here's the thing I can buy that when that's actually being proven I don't want to buy a company with you know tons of revenue but even more expenses I want to have you know a positive return on my investment so I'm not betting on something that um, could potentially become viable I want to buy something that is currently viable and you know obviously hopefully at a good price <clears throat> and we've seen these crazy valuations um, partly due to negative real interest rate which is re which really boosts um, growth stocks um, given um, the negative discount rate because with a growth stock you don't have any uh, fixed return in terms of like you know dividend yield and so what happens is their narrative is really based on their potential to generate a return and because of that the negative discount rate has a more um, impact um, based on the formula when it comes to you know uh, present day value on the discounted cash flow model um, where a negative discount rate increases these uh, no cash flow um, growth stocks a lot more than if you had like a steady cash flow and we're seeing a big wave of retail investing through you know various uh, platforms um, a lot offering like you know zero commission so and you <clears throat> you can also buy odd locks lots not um, normally when you trade securities <clears throat> you have to buy at least a hundred shares and so those are called uh, port, port locks instead of and anything else is you know an odd lot so you can buy like you know one share or a, a, a fraction of a share so that allow that is allowing a lot of um, people <clears throat> who no, but before couldn't buy um, all these stocks that to just own you know a share or a fraction of a share and a lot of them we're, what we're seeing is they're chasing momentum so you know they're chasing like we have you know reddit uh, threads of like what to buy and they're just instead of buying and holding they're just trying to go in and out make quick profits in a very short amount of time so they're not really investing they're trying to gamble <clears throat> And a lot of people, investors and traders nowadays, have yet to experience any long-term bear market given the Fed put, where any time, again, any time that there's any sort of financial liquidity crisis, the Fed has come into the rescue, um, the market every time by increasing liquidity, increasing money supply. <clears throat> And again, no one in the past 40 years have really experienced a long term bear market. Like, we have like small corrections that last like, you know, six months to a year, but there's nothing that are multi year, like five, 10 years long term bear market. And again, that's something that I'm expecting going forward. Now, let's talk about present day. Now, we're seeing um, examples of world decoupling um, of one clear example is Russia and Ukraine where um, Russia really did not want uh, NATO um, to set up base right next uh, right next to them with you know their missile base and Ukraine potentially was you know in talks and joining NATO <coughs> and Russia I guess more more so Putin was really determined to not al allow that to happen and what we're seeing is know um, everyone is denouncing Russia but they're not actually providing you know any mil military support they're just you know again giving supplies they don't want to get involved uh, personally so it sounds like a lot of just talks and they're also not 
um, stopping any uh, trades that are really key and important, like oil and gas, if, uh, because you know they don't want to kind of screw themselves over in terms of EU. So let EU has a huge reliance on oil and gas from um, Russia, and that reliance is built on you know years of um, decommissioning fossil fuels not working hard enough in promoting nuclear while relying a lot on solar and wind and we've already seen the implication of that it is not as reliable because you can't just you know turn up um, the production of energy like you can with nuclear with fossil fuels with solar and wind you're just hoping that there's wind and hoping there's sun today nor do we have the technology in terms of energy storage to really have enough um, for the supply of you know in case the wind doesn't blow in case the sun isn't there and because of that um, you doesn't have the ability to you know cut imports of oil and gas from Russia nor can the US help because not only okay shipping from US to Europe is already difficult um, with you know uh, liquid uh, natural gas because what happens is you know through a pipeline that's you know, a lot easier but if you're trying to uh, transport it you either have to go really low temperature or high pressure so those are two um, very energy costly transportation methods all the way across the ocean instead of just like a pipeline through. <clears throat> and th in terms of oil, um, U.S. have also um, cut back in terms of its domestic oil production, which you know was stemmed from um, when Trump got elected, he promoted a lot of fracking, uh, like U.S. domestic oil, which increased the supply. And what happens is it drove the price down. And a lot of the investors were burned for that. And on top of the green uh, energy narrative, that's why there's not a lot of banks or investors willing to invest in the segment. And that's why we're seeing a lack of capital reinvestment over the years that has created you know a structural um, deficit in terms of production ability so we can't just ramp up production because it takes years of um, capital reinvestment to help uh, the sector to allow for a sustainable level of production and because we have been lacking in that and that's why they can't produce more you know just quickly in a year or two and and so far it looks like russia is having an upper hand and and you know don't believe in what you're seeing in in the media like one of the signs is you know putin reopening russia's um stock market like would he do that if russia wasn't having the upper hand and it looks like there's just slowly pushing um into ukraine and we'll see if um, the president um, of Ukraine strike a deal with Putin. Like again, my standpoint on this is, you know, war is always bad. It it's a no sum game, and you know, I'm just I'm not trying to justify anything. I'm just trying to explain why it is happening in terms of Russia's perspective. What like why did they do this? Um, it's because they didn't want NATO. Um, to set up base and now that Ukraine is saying oh okay yeah we're no longer willing to join NATO but you know Russia's already invaded they're trying to get more benefit instead of you know just leaving and another uh, topic is we're seeing a lot of resource nationalism where countries are limited export of their raw materials to other countries they want to keep it to themselves so that they can use it up first before they they can send it out both like you know they're not sure if there is going to be enough for domestic wise 
and two, they're trying to um, limit export where maybe they can develop those raw materials themselves. So for example, like Hungary, Argentina, uh, Turkey, they're banning food export. And Australia, they're, you know, they're banning their iron ore export. So there are more and more countries are deciding that they don't want to export their raw materials. And that will, again, have implication in terms of um, prices for rest of the world because, okay, if I'm not getting you know, food from Argentina, well, if I don't get as much food from Argentina as I normally do, then, again, that will shrink supply and also increase prices. Now, inflation as a topic, we've seen uh, money printing finally meeting supply constraint, which finally pushed the inflation pressure, again, from financial markets to supermarkets. And in my opinion, Fed missed the opportunity to raise rates in 2021 when, you know, economy was, you know, doing well and inflation was not, um, completely out of control yet it was starting to peak up but you know but comparing to now they're way behind the curve so i really think they should have done that like much sooner instead of allowing financial markets get really overheated you know they could have just slowed the growth of on that but in my opinion i again i've covered this in previous videos where i think it was all due to uh political factors where Fed uh, Chairman Jerome Powell was looking for uh, renomination and because of that he need to make sure that you know market doesn't have any troubles any and therefore he was being hawkish or sorry dovish right up to and and you can see that um, for 2021 uh, December once he got his nomination renomination he went from dovish to hawkish <laughs> which is interesting so he was doing um, he was being dovish saying like oh everything's good we don't have to raise rates you, you guys like in traders and investors don't don't be worried uh, don't sell just keep buying right up till once he got his nomination then he's like oh yeah no we have to fight inflation now we got to raise rates we and, and when we can we're going to shrink the balance sheet as well so again, a lot of political factors in play. Um, and next up, we, we'll take a look at productivity. We, we can see that the labor participation rate in US is not returning to pre-COVID levels. And what that means is instead of just looking at unemployment rate where you know it is uh, quite low um, and, com and comparable to uh, pre-COVID-19 levels, but what happens is not accounted in unemployment are people who just are not looking to work anymore. And this group of people, partly uh, baby boomers who are retiring early, and there are also some younger generation um, and um, people who, you know, maybe they, ha they got lucky with, um, you know, either uh, crypto, meme stocks, whatever, that they're no longer working and they're just full-time trading and what this um, what this does to the economy and the country as a whole is that there's lack of labor where you know it really impacts the country's ability to produce and labor we can also see that labor productivity is also down because um, the working hours are increasing while the cost is also increasing. So labor cost is increasing and labor uh, work hours is also increasing. And what that means is that their productivity is down. And that's probably possibly due to, you know, experienced workers are retiring early. Younger workers didn't get the skills and experience transition or that existing workers are being worked more to try to meet um, existing uh, demand where maybe before you had two workers working this uh, one job or but now there's only one person so that one person has to pick up like overtime um, to try to meet the output of two people 
<clears throat> and so maybe uh, some burnout involved as well. And again, that's why we're seeing uh, productivity not being able to increase. And if productivity does not increase, that's uh, where we see with inflation that we see um, a stagflation spiral where higher prices makes worker, you know, want more higher wages, right? I, hey, look, look at prices of stuff I need to buy. I can't afford them. Can I get paid more? Well, that higher wages put more pressures on higher prices because labor costs is increasing. And if the productivity is not increasing, the uh, company can't sell more. And if they can't sell more to try to earn profit in terms of uh, by selling uh, more quantities at a lower margin, then they have to somehow increase the margin even more. So meaning increase prices. And again, that's why we're seeing um, uh, potential of a stagflation spiral. And that's my th uh, why I believe that we are having stagflation. It's because we have both inflation and productivity is not increasing enough. Now let's talk about the bond market. So we've seen the inverted yield curve and bond market is pricing in a recession. <clears throat> and funny enough, um, a Fed pivot in 2022 because of the recession. And so that if, if economy is going into a downturn, again, the Fed put, they're expecting the Fed put will come in. And and what the, that would do is, you know, in, again, help uh, increase liquidity, try to put... Uh, economy back on track instead of going into recession and that's kind of what the bond market is pricing in but another thing they're taking but but one one thing they're taking wrong though is that they're incorrectly pricing in a recession will take care of inflation pressures because they're thinking oh okay the drop in demand will then bring prices down which is why we see the bond yields, um, which is why I think bond yields have a long way to go in terms of bond yields going up. So yields are going up, so that means bond prices go down. <clears throat> Again, this is more of a long-term thing. I don't, um, I don't know what will happen in terms of short-term. It could go back down or it can keep going higher. But in terms of long-term wise, I think a bond, like the 40-year bond bull market is done. And I think for long-term wise, yields have a long way to go up. And that has huge implications in terms of the economy and financial market. <clears throat> Next up, we are seeing different central, central bank mindsets around the world. Where in the past, whenever a crisis occurs, um, U.S. Uh, Fed is... The, the first one to lower rates, increase money supply to help with liquidity and also asset prices. But what that does is it prop, it, like on, on top of helping with liquidity, it props up uh, bubbles and asset prices, not just in US but also around the world. When other countries, other central banks are doing the same thing. And then what happens is US is the first one to pull the plug where they raise rates and they uh, shrink uh, money supply and what that does is pulls liquidity, pull US dollars from the rest of the world and when they do that when you know foreign investors of other country uh, of other in other countries so let's say US investor in other countries so to other countries the US investor is the foreign investor when they pull away their funds like they sell and they take their money back into US because uh, U.S. now has higher yields because Fed is increasing rates. So, hey, instead of, you know, investing in um, Japan, um, maybe, you know, negative yielding bonds, I can go back to U.S. and buy, like, maybe a 2% treasury. So when they pull that liquidity from the rest of the world, they pop um, the bubbles 
of um, other countries, and when the liquidity comes back to U.S., it helps support their own market. That's what's been happening in the past, but now we're seeing central banks understand that kind of game, and they're not playing it anymore. We're seeing emerging markets and China. I don't know why China is still included in emerging markets. It's kind of weird. Um, they're ahead of both the Fed. And ECB, uh, Europe Central Bank, where they're hiking more rates and earlier, um, where emerging mar- like Latin America, uh, Turkey, you know, uh, China, they hiked rates last year ahead of now Fed hiking rates now, and they hiked more. Where we can see a lot of their central bank rates are much closer. To their inflation rate, so about like eighty percent. So they're not completely, like they're not ahead of the curve yet, but they're not completely behind. They're, like you know, they're a lot closer to the inflation rate than you know the Fed is. Like right now, inflation what seven point five percent, and Fed just raised rates to zero point two five. You you much further behind rather than you know some of these central banks being about eighty percent of the of, of their interest rate um, to uh, the CPI. So now let's talk about the future. So I know this some of these can can already have happened or we're already seeing signs of it, but I don't think um, we've seen the worst of it yet. So some of the crises on horizon we've seen. You know, food shortages, where uh, we have the weather impact, which is causing lower crop production in the first place, and now that it is planting season for a lot of agriculture, you know, spring. Um, but because of the Russia-Ukraine conflict, we're seeing a lack of chemical fertilizers uh, from Russia. Russia and uh, Canada are the two like biggest uh, chemical fertilizer producers. But if we're lacking um, chemi- chemical fertilizers when it's planting season, now what we could see is you know a food shortage later on. So we I don't, I don't think we've seen the last of it. That's what that's the point I'm trying to get across. Next up, again, the energy shortage, the green narrative without proper execution. Um, one example being no nuclear. What happens is again the heavy reliance on solar and wind instead of looking at more sustainable and efficient energy source such as nuclear to try to replace fossil fuels is showing、uh, more long-term implication. It's just not like oh. Okay, we realize it's not working. So you know, let's just go, go, go nuclear, and we'll be fine tomorrow. No, this is a long-term process. It, like you know, building a nuclear plant requires long-term、um, capital investment,、uh, execution, setup. Same with you know, oil and gas. You need long-term capital reinvestment in order to make sure that you can keep a sustainable level of production. But now that we've gone years without either, that's what we're seeing:、um, energy shortage. And yeah, again, you know, investors got burned from U.S. fracking due to the higher production and lower prices, and so did Russia and Middle East because they also export oil. And because of that,、um, that's why we're seeing now, you know. You, uh, Russia and Middle East are not、um, very friendly to towards U.S. because hey, you screwed us over by increasing oil production and、um, you know allowing prices to making prices to go down a lot. And because of that,、uh, when U.S. is like, hey guys, come on, let's maybe increase production, you know, bring the pri- oil price back down, they're like, no, hell no, I'm making bank right now. <laughs> Why would I bother? Like you screwed me last time. I'm not interested anymore. And 
another thing is we're seeing a lot of like not just um, international but domestic uh, political conflicts as well there's a lot of civil unrest like a lot of people are are you know feeling pressures from um, you know everyday life like for example like for um, inflation or wealth gap and they're finding outlets um, they're feeling you know maybe it's this or that but what they're seeing is the kind of symptom of the disease like you know why why am I working so hard but not making a lot or I'm not being able to buy much right why why uh, why are prices going so much faster than my wages instead of thinking like oh you know I should get paid more um, they're not thinking like oh why is prices moving up so much so they're not looking deeper for the cause of the problem but they're just looking at the problem and because of that different people are have, having a lot of different opinion and I uh, feel that our um, people are becoming more uh, polarized meaning maybe there are more people willing to hear each other out um, and may be able to meet each other in the middle and try to see like what the uh, other person is thinking but now we're seeing more polarized views where you know it's either one uh, one side of the political spectrum or the other side there's no more kind of oh okay so what do you want why do you want that so that's kind of what I'm thinking in terms of um, um, people uh, not cooperating with each other not trying to hear each other out now let's take a look at financial market so emerging markets again is ahead uh, in the rate cycle in the central bank rate cycle they're catching up to CPI and I have and I think they'll um, take care of that by doing so then you know US and ECB who's you know way behind the curve well the question is then who's gonna pay the bill this time because in the past again US is ahead of everyone they hike rates first they pull liquidity from the rest of the world to help support their financial market well if other countries are ahead of them this time when US when like right now when they're hiking rates they're not having that impact anymore who's gonna pay the bill maybe someone's still behind the curve maybe it's ECB maybe it's uh, uh, Bank of Japan who knows and again my my thinking is that we're returning to a long-term bear market for both bonds and equities because of you know interest rates having to go back up because of higher inflation or you know just higher inflation would, could do it too because you know it's hard for companies to operate when your costs keep rising and then you have pressure to rise prices it really eats up margin but if you raise price too much then you know people will, will notice very quickly and you know not what willing to buy your stuff and if anyone's thinking like oh you know these companies are making a lot of money anyways they shouldn't be rise, raising prices they should just eat up their um, profit well we can actually take a look in terms of uh, the CPI versus uh, the P PPI the PPI is still up like the producer price index is still you know ahead of CPI and so because of that we know that uh, companies are paying more like they're experiencing higher cost and they haven't transferred all of it to the CPI or to the consumer and so again for anyone that's thinking oh, you know these companies are still making like a lot more money or you know they should just make no profit right <laughs> funny funny thoughts um, and in terms of economy um, again as mentioned before I think stagflation is here because of the lack of productivity growth that we can't get out of the stagnant part and we can see that from that da from data from you know PMI from durable goods retail sales where you know I think PMI could be on the path downwards uh, durable goods retail sales we can see that oh it's increasing but it's increasing uh, due to prices so uh, CPI is increasing faster than durable 
goods sales are increasing. That means quantity is coming down. And because quantity is coming down, that means you know people are not buying as much. The only reason why durable goods are increasing is because prices, but quantity is going down. <clears throat> and it's showing uh, weakness. And I think you know China, uh, uh, sorry, uh, I think EU will soon follow US into weakness as well while China looks like it's coming on the other end showing prospect. Now let's talk about the Fed's decision. What do they have to decide on? Well, currently they're forecasting more rate hikes. But if um, we are seeing economy uh, starting to roll over, which is what the bond market is pricing in, and what we're seeing from the data, economic data and if the economy starts to roll over will they surrender to inflation will they come to the rescue again and that's again what the bond market is pricing in if they surrender to inflation that means allow it to continue to get out of control because they have to cut rates uh, QE5 I think will mark the final run before the ultimate collapse where they have to take control of inflation you know hiking rates very aggressively you know ignoring what happens to uh, financial market and asset prices or um, you know the currency just goes to garbage you know why my republic so 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 what kind of, that, that's the idea like what are we going to do um, because they did not because the Fed did not hike rates enough last year in comparison to you know the rest of the uh, some emerging markets they have room to cut rates US Fed does not have room to cut rates and because of that they will have to do a lot more in terms of you know QE if they want to um, avoid economy rolling over and what that would do is kicking the can down the road making the ultimate collapse just that much worse and the end game I've made a video on this before is either save the currency by you know just crashing everything raising rates cutting money supply uh, shrinking balance sheet or you just let it get completely out of control, you know, Weimar Republic, Zimbabwe, let the currency get out of control, like become worthless. And the, the point I'm trying to get across is that recession is not a disease, but it's rather the cure of an overheated economy where, you know, companies that should not have been viable gets bankrupt. And it gets clean up. There's a debt restructuring. But when we, if we keep bailing out companies or we keep bailing out anyone, what that happens is you allow, you increase more debt into the company and you just produce more zombie companies. Instead of making these companies go bankrupt, the management pays for it, the people who invest in it pay for it. Um, you just allow the bad decision, bad management to continue to operate. And I think this is kind of uh, the reason why there's, you know, more social unrest and wealth gap. Because, you know, people who have made bad decisions, <clears throat> who did not look into um, investing, like the, they did not look into the company, what they do, their um, financial reports before investing... They have been lucky and gotten saved because we keep coming back and save them. And those people who were more prudent and not, you know, invest so reckless, uh, recklessly, they have been burned because they're paying the cost of not seeing their asset prices go up, but they're paying the cost and seeing, you know, their uh, purchasing power go down. And so it's not a fair game. You can't privatize uh, profits and socialize losses. 
like I think all everyone should bear uh, consequences of their own action, and therefore I don't think anyone should get a bailout. People or company or countries. So in summary, I think these are changing times. The investment mindsets that have worked in the past, I don't think will work again. Where you know just Whenever you see a dip, just buy and hold, right? But I think, you know, it will be a long time before any dip. I think, like, especially when, you know, we see any big rally, people will, you know, get very overly excited and rush in and thinking, oh, that's the, uh, the bottom, uh, that, that was the bottom, we're good to go, you know, Fed got our back, like, let's go, like, buy in, all in. I don't think that's going to work anymore. You really have to look into um, what you're investing in instead of chasing the, the high flyer names. There's more naturalistic mindsets when it comes to resource and people where instead of uh, collaborating with the rest of the world, I think uh, there's going to be more, okay, I need to protect myself first. I need to support myself first. And then if I have extra, then I can, you know, help you guys out. It's more like me first, but on a national basis. I think there will be bigger government because there is bigger conflicts, because there is bigger unrest. People always tend to look um, for, at the government for help. <laughs> like, oh, you know, th those people um, are somehow wiser than me. And they must have solutions for everything, right? So that will cause more reliant on, you know, government uh, spending, you know, which, again, in my mind, will facilitate more wealth transfer. And the kind of key, key takeaway is just understand the wheels are in motion and that, you know, don't, don't fear it. You don't think you can necessarily uh, change it I think it is just something to understand that is coming and try to uh, make the best of it because I think you know this is kind of um, a cycle that we have to go through and in terms of investment wise like look to history of a stagflation you know the most uh, more prominent one 1970s in US for in terms of investment ideas look for uh, companies who have pricing power um, you know it could be some monopolistic uh, characteristics like few companies operate um, they have uh, control or more control in terms of their ability to raise prices um, some some companies with strong cash flows and low reinvestment costs, meaning, okay, on a year-to-year -year basis, I don't have to reinvest a lot. And so, you know, if inflation occurs, my prices can go up. But even if my cost goes up, I, I, I don't have to, you know, pay as much every, on an annual basis. So then, you know, I would still net out positive. And inflation will help on that prospect um, other things like you know commodities for markets you know again strong cash flow companies that is key not just you know these growth stocks who might be viable in a few years you need strong cash flow companies now and finally just be on the right side of this wealth transfer and that is all for today thank you